morning, EBC family. I cannot tell you how good it is to be greeting you all from our sanctuary, at least with a couple of our brothers and sisters here. It's a, a great first step in uh, hopefully soon having all of you back here together. Uh, I thank the Lord for what he's been doing in our lives through all of this, but we sure miss being together. So we've been praying for you. Thank you for just how you have stayed connected. I know this morning is going to be a true blessing to you. Uh, just already listening to the worship, God has touched my heart, and I know he's going to touch all of yours. A verse that came to my mind this week that I just want to encourage you all with is Psalms chapter 62, verse 11. It says, God has spoken plainly, and I have heard it many times. Power, O oh God, belongs to you. Unfailing love, O oh Lord, is yours. That's the God we serve. I hope we have said it many, many times to ourselves and our homes that God's still in control. We can still trust him completely. And not only is he completely in, in control, he loves each and every one of us dearly. He knows our names. He knows how many hairs on our heads. He knows everything that's going on in our lives. And he's in control. So my prayer this morning, let's get our focus off ourselves. We're going to sing songs about an incredible God that we serve. And I promise you, the more that we turn our focus to him, something happens inside our heart because our hearts were never supposed to focus on ourselves. They were supposed to be focused on our Lord. So I'm thankful for this opportunity to join all of you. Uh, thanks for Pastor Eve for the message that he's going to bring. Thank you for Dan. Thanks for the worship team. Love you all so very much. And I know it's going to be a blessing to our whole church family this week. So let's begin this service in a word of prayer and give this time to the Lord. Dear God, I thank you for being our great God. All power is yours. Forgive us for ever questioning that. Forgive us for being afraid, for doubting, for being anxious. Our Heavenly Father is completely in control. Thank you for reminding us of that this morning. And thank you, God, for loving us with unconditional love, with love that is truly out of this world. I pray, Lord, that we'll allow you to wrap your arms around us in these next few minutes. I pray that we will join together in worship of you, exalt your name above all names. And Lord, I pray that you'll work in every single person's heart that is watching, that is listening, that is participating this morning. So bless the service. We give it to you in Jesus' name. Good morning, church family. We are grateful to be here, excited to be here. We want to worship that great God that, he, that Pastor Joel is talking about. We want you to join him with us wherever you are, whatever you're doing this morning. Sing with us. What turned into wine? Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power 
Lord, we magnify you this morning. You are a great God. You are all-consuming. You are large and in charge. We are thankful and grateful that no matter what happens, no matter what goes around us, that you are in complete control. You love us so much. Lord, burn that in our hearts. Whether the world seems out of control, we know that you are completely in and we can rest on you. We pray now that you would anoint the words of Pastor Eve. Give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, worship team. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> I can't tell you how excited I am to be here and uh, to share with you God's word. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. I got a lot of scriptures I want to uh, hit you with this morning. Um, I want you to take a, a drink from the fire hydrant that is God's word this morning. I want to hit you with a lot of scriptures, so follow along. And it's designed so that you go back and you actually read some of these scriptures for yourself. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. So we're going to start and we're going to go to Ecclesiastes. We're going to find our way into Daniel. We're going to find our way into Matthew. So uh, let's, uh, let's get to it. Um, first, let's, uh, let's pray once again. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love, your grace, and this time that we can share together. Bless your word now as we open it. And I pray you would change us ever so slightly for your glory. Thank you for your word and all God's people said, amen. Go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I'm reading from the NLT, and we'll start at verse 9. The writer says, history merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it's old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we're doing now. Solomon tells his reader in this past passage that there's nothing new that's ever hit the planet. I can, you can almost see him yawn and say, you know, it's, it's been here before. What's been here before will be again. There's nothing new under the sun. If you've seen it today, guess what? It's been here before. You aren't really experiencing something new on the planet. Now, some might say, well, well Pastor Eve, this, this coronavirus is new. It's, it's called the novel coronavirus. Novel means new. We've never seen anything like this type before. People's immune systems aren't used to it. Uh, they aren't trained to it. And where that might be true, think about this. Deadly viruses are not new. We've heard or we've seen deadly viruses before. Many of you have uh, heard of the Spanish flu. The world has seen deadly viruses before. A virus of this nature may be new for me and you. It's, what it's doing to our culture might be new for, for us. But that speaks to the larger fact that man's time here on earth at best is brief in comparison to the backdrop of all time. What we've got to reconcile is the fact that everything has a reason, has a season, and has a time. And you are on this planet for this moment in time, for this time and purpose. God's plan for us is that we reap a harvest. Uh, I want to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 2. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest. Now contrary to popular belief, no matter how old you are, time is not on your side. It's not. We all have an ordained set amount of time to live. Now, we all mean well when we tell teenagers that they have time to choose where they want to go to college, and they have time to figure out what they want to do in life, but no one knows truly what tomorrow brings besides God. And so we don't have time. We have an appointed amount of time. Only God knows what will happen tomorrow. All you have is truly today. And now, that doesn't mean that you don't plan or think about tomorrow. Uh, on the contrary, you realize the precious nature of today. And you invest in today in such a way that whether you're here tomorrow or not, you are ready or your progeny is ready, your kids, your grandchildren, your children and their children, they're ready to reap the harvest of the things that you've planted today. You see, God wants us to be farmers. And farmers understand something very important. Um, they spend most of their time planting and waiting, right? And the farmer understands that in planting, someday he will harvest. God is always calling us to plant because he deserves a good harvest from our lives. And the harvest will be a good harvest if we plant good seed, 
during this time? What are you planting right now? What are you planting in your relationships? What are you planting in regards to your faith today? What are you planting today that will help your faith grow tomorrow? What spiritual seed is going into the ground at this moment that hopefully, again, your grandchildren and their children will reap the benefits from? You see, I'm, I'm here today because my great-great-grandparents were believers, and they shared the gospel with their, with their children, and my great-grandparents shared the gospel with their children, and my, uh, my parents shared the gospel with me, and I'm here today because my parents shared the gospel with me. How about you? What are you planting that's going to affect future generations to come. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. We see what those who look to future generations, um, and specifically those of faith, and my grandparents, and maybe your grandparents as well, they saw and had one singular purpose. And Solomon says, this is what should be every man's singular purpose. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. That's the whole story. He comes to the end of this book, and he says, here now is my conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. You see, Solomon, he's telling us when everything is boiled down, this is what should be our singular focus. God deserves our attention. God deserves our focus. God deserves our dedication, no matter what time period we live in. God deserves it all. God is the, uh, the divine planter. And he's planted, think about it, he's planted all of us on this planet. And he deserves a harvest from our lives. What does that mean? And what does that look like? Well, I think that looks like this word, consecration. We see that in the scriptures. We don't see it too often or use it too often. But it's in the, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's in a different form. It's a word, sacrifice. It's, it's, it happens when a person sets themselves apart for the purposes of God. This can be for a short time, it should be for a long time, it should be for the, the long, over the life period of a believer. There are so many examples of this in the scriptures. This morning I want to look at just one, and that's Daniel. Daniel was a consecrated man. You know the stories in uh, you, the book of Daniel. And his life was consecrated to God, set apart for God. In this age of coronavirus, we've all set our par- ourselves apart for a certain particular reason. We're trying to stay safe in this time. The question is, what are we setting ourselves apart for in the grand picture? And for what purpose? Many of us and most of us are finding ourselves in a situation that we never, uh, we've never dealt with before. We're, we're making tough choices about various aspects of our lives. Choices that we never thought we'd had to make. Daniel was in the same boat and even worse. When you read about his life and you read the opening chapter of Daniel, You find that his nation was invaded by the Babylonians. His city was burned down to the ground. Most of his family and his friends were either killed or captured and deported. He was deported himself to a foreign country, and he was forced to serve a new king. And I'm sure there were people around him who said, where is God when we need him most? Why why has God let this happen? But this is not what we find in Daniel, because I believe that Daniel is a man who's consecrated himself. Not that he didn't find this to be a bad situation. I'm sure he did. But Daniel consecrated himself. And when a person consecrates themselves, sets themselves apart, what they're saying is, God, no matter what, I'm dedicated to you. No matter where I am, no matter what king I have to serve, I'm going to set, be set apart for you, for your glory, because that is what you deserve from my life. His consecration followed him all the way to Babylon, and he would be tested when he got there. Daniel was chosen to be and serve in the king's court. You know the story. I won't go through all of it. He was going, uh, going to have to measure up to the king's standards, and part of this was that he would have to eat food that would go against his Jewish religion. So Daniel humbly protested, and we find that in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But when Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to him by the king, he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. 
I, I won't go into the rest of the story. You know most of the story. And if you don't know it, I encourage you to go back and read it in the book of Daniel. God blessed Daniel, though, with wisdom. He blessed him with understanding. And he was used in the king's court to influence people for the glory of God. We find this truth. When we consecrate ourselves, when we sacrifice ourselves, when we set ourselves apart for God's use, guess what? God uses us. And he, he'll employ us even for things we can't even imagine. We fast forward to chapter 6, and we find a few, few things that just changed in uh, Daniel's life. The culture around him changed. In chapter 1, he was taken from his home and everything he knew uh, Babylon came in, came in, deported him, and they, were, uh, con they conquered Jerusalem. Well, in 539 B.C., uh, the Medo-Persians came in, and they conquered Babylon. And Daniel found himself in a different position in the kingdom, albeit he retained a high position because of his character. We see that consecration is still in Daniel's life. He's still set apart for God, even in older age. He was in his 60s probably about this time, and we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Verse 4. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, now listen to this, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. You see, Daniel's consecration set him apart from others. Even in this new kingdom, it didn't take long for Daniel to stand out. But notice, Daniel, even though his mortgage had been sold a couple of times, now he's, he's working for a different kingdom. He's worked and served for multiple kings now. His attitude and spirit still honor the Lord. We never get a bad vibe from Daniel as you read through the story of Daniel. You never get a bad taste in your mouth after reading something about Daniel. Why? Because... Daniel realizes something. As he's serving these foreign kings who pretty much are enslaving him into their service, he realizes, I'm not serving them. I'm serving someone greater. Serving someone greater. So come what may, Daniel is going to remain consecrated to the Lord, and this meant that he honored the rules. Listen, he honored the rules of the kingdom so long as those rules and laws were not designed to destroy his faith. Well, there will always be haters, and Daniel and some of his um, own close associates uh, hated him. They were those that were jealous of his favor that the king gave. And so they decided to get the king to sign uh, into law something that would definitely put Daniel into a bind. But they know that the only way to, to entrap him is through his faith. And so his faith, we understand, was so evident and so consistent that they knew they could count on Daniel to follow through with following his God. That, my friends, is what we call a solid faith, where people can take it to the bank. You're going to follow God no matter what. You know the story. They trick the king into signing a law that can't be undone, and, they, and then they wait. And sure enough, we read what happens in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home, knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Isn't that amazing? Daniel knew he was being set up. Daniel knew that he was going to suffer the consequences as a result. But he just went on like nothing was, was abnormal. He just did his thing. Why? Because in the face of suffering, Daniel decided that it was better to honor the Lord than to give in to the fear of death. You know, we can learn a lot from Daniel's life. Even though Daniel lived 
many years before Jesus came to earth, he understood this principle that we see in Matthew chapter, 5, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 27. Then Jesus says to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways and take up your cross and follow me. If you're trying to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. People, whether or not you're faced with difficult decisions at work or among your family or among your friends, the harvest of your actions will be determined by the planting of your faith seeds that you're doing today. We're looking at the person in Daniel who committed his life to the Lord and trained himself to God. And when his life was turned upside down, as many of our lives are turned upside down, who he was as a person had ample opportunity to shine. You see, in the privacy of our own homes and in this time of isolation, we have the ability to plant seeds of faith, I believe. When you chased after God in prayer, praying for your neighbors and coworkers and those in the front lines, when you set aside time to study the Bible, I mean really study the Bible and get into it, your faith will grow. And what you're doing is adding to your treasure chest the riches of faith in God and the resources that you're going to need in the future. Believe me. You're like a cactus. You're storing up precious water that allows you to survive and thrive in the desert. Now is the time to plant. Now is the time to set yourself apart and to grow in the Lord. Don't come out of quarantine only having more knowledge about what are the best shows to, to, to binge watch on Netflix or how to get your internet working just right so that everyone in your household can, can stream HD movies without any glitch. Don't come out of quarantine with, with that skill, only that skill. Learn things about the Bible you've never taken the time to learn before. Learn more verses than, gen, than just John 3.16. Learn the Romans road. What is that? Find out. Google it. I'm not going to tell you. Learn the Romans road if you don't know. Learn how to lead someone to Christ. Learn how to love your neighbors better. There are so many re resources at your disposal online. Go for it. If it's not on our webpage, find it somewhere else. It's not about us giving you what you need. It's about the Lord teaching you what you need for your life. You know a big reason that God led his people Israel through the wilderness was so that they would learn something. So that they would learn that man does not live on bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God wants to, wants to plant something in you that will last generations. So prepare yourself. Consecrate yourself. Set yourself apart. Don't waste this time, but use this time. And God won't waste his time in your life either. I conclude with this. I heard a recent story of a woman who was caught up in sex trafficking, and for years she was trapped. And during her trapped years, she developed addictions that um, were very, very difficult to break. And praise the Lord, she was delivered from her captors. But as is true of so many who are caught up, even though she was delivered from her captors, she had a difficult time breaking those addictions that she had learned when she was, when she was caught up in it. She was a believer, and in a, season, in a season of failure, she told God, she said, God, I, I give up. I can't do it anymore. I can't break these addictions. She said, God spoke to her heart. We'll call her Shannon. I don't know her name, but Shannon, he said, it wasn't by your choice that you were a slave. But now you've been freed, and you've given the devil more time than you've given to me. Shannon, being convicted about that, said, God, you're right. I've given the devil more of myself than I've given you. You see, Shannon expected that God would do for her in a short time what it took the devil years to develop in her. Maybe she's like us because we expect God to be the miracle maker that he is so that we don't have to do any work. But we have to do the work. We have to plant. Shannon felt as if God was saying to her, Shannon, 
If you give me as much time as you've given the devil, I promise I won't waste that time. I won't waste it. People of God, I think God is saying to us while we're in quarantine, give me as much time as you give to other things and I promise you I won't waste it. Now is the time to do homework. Now is the time to spend more time in communication with God. Now is the time to figure out your faith. Now is the time to recalibrate your life and set a course that come what may, God is ready to call your number. And when God calls your number, you're ready to go. Amen? Where's your team? Would you come and I'll close. Father in heaven, we want to consecrate ourselves to you. We need to consecrate ourselves to you. We've got to set ourselves apart because there are things that you have in store that if we're not ready, you're going to pass us by and you're going to use somebody else. But God, I'm asking that you would use us, that we would be ready. So in this time of quarantine, in this time of isolation, we're separated from each other. And it feels like we're coming out of that soon. I'm thankful for that. But while we have time, God, I pray you would use it and not allow us to squander. Bless us, God, with your word. Bless us in prayer. Help us to seek you in prayer. God, cause your word to grow in us, and may we be used for your glory. Thank you so much. In Christ, name I pray. Amen. As we close our time this morning, we want to share a song that's really a prayer of blessing. It comes from Numbers chapter 6. It says, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace.
children in His presence. Go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. In His presence. Go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you in the morning. He is for you, He is for you in the morning, in the evening, and you're coming, and you're going, and you're weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 He is for you. 